But so, so I think if you read it just on the surface level like that, it does seem like a ridiculous story. But the way I ended up yeah, after, after yeah. going Where did you through go with a it? couple different theories. Hello everyone, this is Mark Peters with the Frog Outside the Well Research Center. And today we've got a friend back. This is Julie, Julie Danes. Annyeonghaseyo. Annyeonghaseyo, that's good. She's learning Korean. She's one of the Korean students at Yummies. Yeah. And you're in the, I, I said advanced class. Yeah, don't say advanced. I'm in the intermediate. So I'm barely a step above beginner. But she's learning Korean. Getting it's that. really marvelous. And she is a writer. Yes. And a, what, YouTuber? Uh, yeah, we do have a, a YouTube channel, me and some of the other local authors where we... It's called Fiction in Real Life, where we discuss interesting stories. Interesting stories. Yes. You like them the weirder the better. The weirder the better. Well, in fact, we take a lot of stories from people who send them in, oh. and then we retell it. Oh, really? Yeah. So. Uh, I need to watch your channel more. What's the name of your channel? It's called Fiction in Real Life. Okay, so look at Fiction in Real Life. Yeah. And speaking of weirder, we're going to talk about a weird story today. It was weird. It was weird, but, <laughs> but you liked it. I loved it. I loved it. Really? Yeah. We're talking today about Wings by Isan. And this is a, here's a Korean word for you, Pilsu Guamok. Pilsu means required. Mm. Guamok is course. It's, it's a required reading for Korean students. Hmm. With Lucky Day, last time we did Lucky yeah. Day, uh, and this one, Wings, yeah. and the three or four others are, are stories that everybody has read. Hmm, interesting. Now, this one was written in what year? 1936. And 1936, Korea is in the throes of? The Japanese occupation. Japanese occupation. And this is written by a fellow by the name of Lee Song. Now, it turns out Koreans have pen names. Yeah. And the fellow on the 1001 note is Tege Sun Sang, and the fellow, mm. fellow, on the, fellow on the 5,000 note is Yulgok Sun Sang. Mm. That's the Korean style pen name. It's a, a, sort of an honorific name. That's, they don't change their real name. But Lee Sang is more of a Mark Twain, George Eliot mm. kind of a story, because Mark Twain was not his real name, right? George Eliot was a female yeah. writing with a male name to get her things published. Right. And this is a true pen name, a completely <laughs> different name. His name originally was... Kim... <laughs> Kim Hae-kyung? Kim Hae-kyung. And why in the world is he called Lee Sang? Well, if I understand it correctly, he worked in some kind of Japanese... It was an architectural firm. Architectural firm, and they didn't know his name, and they didn't care to know his name, so they just called him E Song, and Song in Japanese is like... Mr. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So instead of calling by his name, they just kept saying Isang, Isang. And he, he thought uh, 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 the the boss was not paying attention. Oh, this is Mr. Lee, Mr. Kim. It's all Kim and Lee. It doesn't make any difference. <laughs> and he's calling, "Hey, Mr. Lee," and he's Mr. Kim, so he didn't respond. Yeah. He said, "Hey, Mr. Lee," and he didn't respond. Hey, Isang, I'm talking to you. And he decided it's kind of a. It's it's passive aggression. It is. It's passive aggression. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, it's a little bit in your face. American Indians do this with the white man, too. If the white man is uh, over overbearing about something, they just go along with it, and it's playing the dummy. Mm. And he's playing the dummy to be, okay, I'm Isang. And he wrote under this mm -hmm. name. Well, he is so successful. Uh, you probably don't know this, but one of the major literary prizes given every year is the Isang Prize. Oh, I didn't know that. That's yeah. really interesting. So that shows you the stature of this of this man. Yeah. Uh, but his, his writing is really, really different. It is it is very different. And at first I was a little bit confused about what is this story even about. Yeah. But by the end, I really loved it and I have a lot of theories about it. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, I think we can't worry about spoiler alerts. We'll just say it here and now, if you haven't read his song and you want to read it, uh, yeah. you better read it because we're going to launch right into it. Right. Well, even with a spoiler alert, the ending is so ambiguous that there's and, no way to really spoil it. And that has to do with wings yeah. in the most 
odd way. And everything else about it is, oh, I want to say one more thing about Isang being an odd fellow. Oh. And that is, this is a sort of a personal note and it's highly subjective, but I think it's true. And that is, I've heard of three or four graduate students who have written PhDs on Isang yeah. in literary fields. None of them have finished. If you launch into Isang, you're launching into a hopeless morass that you can never get out of. Wow. Well, I mean, and he died at what, 27? Yeah. So that's a short amount of time to have amassed that much creativity and, you know, interesting yeah. literature. So Wings, what are your theories? What's it all yeah. about? Well, I feel like if you just read this at face value, it's kind of a ridiculous story, yeah. right? Because the main character is so naive and so, he just doesn't have any clue what's going on. Um, in the story, he lives with this wife and he's stuck in the back room with no light and his wife lives in the front room and she keeps entertaining all these men and he keeps asking, I don't know what's going on out there. I don't know what's going on out there, but she keeps bringing him coins and it's very obvious what's going on out there. Yeah. And so you start to question, is this guy an idiot? Maybe he's on drugs of some kind. Maybe he's mentally, I mean, it does have some schizophrenic, you know, overtones about this main character. But I just, I don't think that's it because he says right at the beginning of the story, he says, have you heard about the genius who ended up a stuffed specimen? So he's telling you right at the beginning that he's not an idiot. He's yeah. a genius, even though he's a stuffed genius, meaning... Mounted on the wall like yeah, a trophy he's of some got kind. all this intelligence inside, but he has no life. He's he, In all other aspects, he's dead. Yeah. He's yeah. stuffed. And, and he's locked in the bathroom, which is inside of his wife's room. Yeah. So he can't come out when his wife is entertaining guests. Right. And he has to occupy himself in the bathroom by playing with jars right. of Well, when his wife perfume. falls asleep. No, no, no. When his wife goes out, he goes into his wife's room. And that's when he starts to play with the jars. And so he kind of tries to get back at his wife by like, messing around with her cosmetics and burning holes in a toy her toilet paper with a magnifying glass but so so i think if you read it just on the surface level like that it does seem like a ridiculous story but the way i ended up yeah after, after yeah going Where did you through go a it? couple different theories i ended up deciding that it is an allegory of the stages that people go through when their country is occupied by an enemy force yeah so it has a political. I method. think it, I felt like it had some political overtones, and it was a real allegory. Do you know this? That although the twenties and into the late thirties was a liberal time, they called it the cultural policy, and mm -hmm. they allowed publication, and publications flourished in Korean. This is before they start cracking down, and you can't do Korean anymore. They're allowing publications in Korean, and uh, uh, and yet they're censored. Yeah. And so this had to get past the censor. Yeah. And that well, might be what he's doing with he this He did thing. a good job disguising it. In fact, yeah. I read a little bit about the author and this piece of work. And he said, uh, this other author about Isang said that he was criticized for the story, The Wings, because it was not as politically active as they thought it should be. Like mm -hmm. they wanted more of a resistance message. But maybe he couldn't have gotten that past the censor. Right. But this one, uh, I think it's very clever in that it has a very, very strong political message. Yeah, I think so too. And yet, if he'd have said so outright, outright yeah. the censors would have never allowed it to be published. Yeah. And as it was, the censors looked at this and said, that's a stupid story. These Koreans are really stupid. <laughs> they don't read a stupid story like that. Yeah, go ahead and publish it. Yeah, it was really interesting to read. I really felt like it just outlined the stages that people go through when their country is overtaken, at first it's confusion, a little bit of ignorance, just like he's hiding in this back room. He doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't understand. Then he's a little bit in denial. He turns a blind eye when it sort of does become obvious what's happening and that he has had his freedom taken away from him, in this case by his wife, which of course is the symbol of the whole Japanese takeover. Then he gets that growing anxiety. He starts to understand that he's being treated poorly. His wife gets all the good food. He gets all the terrible food. He starts to suspect that his wife is now actually poisoning him with these sleeping pills. 
So then he kind of tries to make an effort, but it's a futile effort because there's nothing he can do. He takes yeah. his money, he goes out, he tries to do something, he comes home with nothing. Yeah. And then in the end, this is the open ending, right? Where yeah. you don't know, he climbs up to the top of this department store and I think it is highly symbolic that it is a Japanese department store yeah. and not any other type of edifice. Yeah. And he's standing on the edge and he's like, do I have wings? Can I fly? Or not, yeah. You know? What uh, what does the um, let's talk about the wife? What does she represent? Well, I really do feel like she sort of represents the um, the oppression that was placed on the Korean people at this yeah. time. What do the, her customers represent? Well, I don't know. That's a good question. I didn't actually think about that one. I have a really straightforward analysis. Of okay, this. I see the guy, the protagonist, as the Korean people. Mm, I yeah. see the yeah, no, wife. Yeah, for sure. I see the wife as the country of Korea mm, okay. that is being prostituted by the Japanese guests that come and go. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. Too. And the Japanese bring in gifts, nice bottles of perfume and shampoo. And in effect, I think his song is saying, hey, Korea, wake up. We're selling our soul yeah. For the sake of a few shiny little bottles. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I definitely agree with that. And I felt that too, that he really tried to show how the Japanese people sort of lured them into this false sense of security and all will be well and things will be better. Prosperous. Prosperous. Yeah. Everyone will get something and they, you know, built these beautiful Japanese buildings, but all of it in order to manipulate the Korean people into just sort of weakening their nationalism. And as people read this story, they started looking at these other layers and they're saying, yeah, you're right. Look at us. We're, we're, we're subjugated by the Japanese. We're losing our culture. We're losing our, our very soul uh, to the Japanese for the sake of what the G Japanese talked about as material development and yeah. economic uh, prosperity yeah. yeah so it's quite a story it, it's very interesting i really recommend it it's so you like weird stories i like weird stories i like stories with layers and this has so many layers yeah. and i really feel like it was purposefully written for open interpretation yeah, yeah. about this about that about the nature of man versus modern world i mean there's just so many layers um do you know, uh, in my anthropology classes, I learned this phrase that uh, good symbols are multivocal and, oh, what's the other word? <laughs> multivocal and polysemic. Mm -hmm. Polysemic and multivocal. Yeah. Which is a way of saying a lot of different ways of expressing it. Yeah. Multiple, multivocal and polysemic having lots of different meaning. Yeah. That's symbolism. Yeah. And this thing is just full of that. And every person that reads a story brings with them their background and their life experience. And each person has a different life experience. And that's what makes that kind of writing so interesting because so many different people un just understand it differently based on their own life. Yeah. Yeah. Experience. Well, uh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah. I, love uh, I don't know that I ever did. I don't know that I got beyond the disgust of the story. Well, it was disgusting. <laughs> it, it, was it, was disgusting. Was, it was really <laughs> hard to imagine. Honestly, it was hard to imagine that a person could be so ignorant of what was going yeah, on. Yeah, which but, is the obvious play on it. Which is the obvious play. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, uh, today's production is brought to you by the Korean, uh, LA, uh, Korean Cultural Center in LA, who's helping uh, produce this one. This is in our series of modern Korean literature. And uh, Julie, thanks for coming in and sharing yeah, your perspective fine. on this. Thanks one. for introducing me to this story. I have never read it before. Well, we'll find some more. Great. Okay. <laughs> and we'll see you next time on The Frog Outside the Well. Bye. Bye.